different parts of his teachings. The Buddha described almost every aspect of the practice as a form of wealth. Though there's seven noble treasures, he talked of the wings to awakening as the treasures of the teaching. Goodwill, he says, is a, the wealth of a monk. Concentration practice is food for the soldiers that are doing the right effort. The different parts of the practice are meant to sustain you. Even though there's a lot we let go of, there's certain things you should hold on to as long as you need them. In the John Lee's image, he said the Buddha wants us to let go like rich people. In other words, we amass wealth, and then we can put it aside. And then even though we're not carrying it around all the time, it's still there when we need it. But while you're building it, you have to hold on. and learn how to let go of other things. If you let go of everything, you have nothing. But if you hold on to skillful things, then it's a lot easier to let go of the unskillful ones. So as we're developing virtue, concentration, and discernment, remember that these are your valuables. These are things of the world come and go. People, relationships come and go. There was a novel I read one time, it's called The Good Soldier. It's narrated by one of the characters, who is a very slippery fellow. And one of the dominant images throughout the book is of reflections off water. People are reflections off water. They're there, and then they're gone, and then they're there again, and gone again. But the elements of the practice are a lot more reliable. There's a passage where Venerable Sariputta has passed away. Venerable Ananda comes to see the Buddha and talks about how much he misses Sariputta, how it feels like He's lost his bearings. And the Buddha said, why? Did he take virtue with him? Did he take concentration, discernment, release, knowledge and vision of release? In other words, all the good things of the practice? No, they're still there. Which is why this is the kind of wealth you want to develop and hold on to while you need it. And of course, the nature of all wealth is that it comes from giving. Like with the precepts, as the Buddha said, if you hold to the precepts in all circumstances, you're giving a universal gift of safety to everybody. In other words, nobody has to fear that you're going to kill them or steal anything from them, have illicit sex with people they love, lie to them take intoxicants. He says you're giving universal safety. It's a gift to everybody. And when, this, when the safety is universal, then you have a part of that safety as well. So it's by giving that you gain. Same with concentration. You're giving up the things that you might want to think about right now. Thoughts can come in. Many times they're thoughts you just as happy to not have to be thinking. But other times they come in and they're compelling. And part of the mind says, here we've got a whole hour you can think about this. You can wait and get into concentration toward the end of the hour. But you have to say no. You give it up. Whatever good things would come from those thoughts, they can wait for some other time. And even if they don't come back, you're going to be working on something a lot more valuable.
a mind that can be still, a mind that can be solid, that can develop a sense of well-being inside simply by being with the breath. And then as the breath gets more and more subtle, the mind can be with itself and can be sufficient for itself. The same with discernment. To gain discernment, you've got to give up some things. You have to give up a lot of your illusions, illusions that the mind likes to hold on to that give you some comfort, but they're going to disappoint you at some point. So you have to learn how to give them up. Then you gain the, the wealth of having a perspective in the mind that can step back from your attachments. and view them with a little bit of skepticism, and all the excuses the mind gives, oh, I've got to hold on to this, got to hold on to that, can't live without this, can't live without that. And the Buddha says, you can perfectly well live without these things. In fact, you're better off many times without them. And even if they are good things, you have to be wary about getting too overly dependent on them. So the gain comes from giving. But these things are your real wealth. This is especially important to remember as you're going out into the world, because the world has lots of other ideas they want to sell you. But that's it. They want to sell you these things. So they dress them up so that you want to, make, you want to buy them. And then once you've bought them, as far as they're concerned, their responsibility to you has ended. But you remember with the Buddha, the Buddha is very responsible. He said, this leads to true happiness. These practices, if you follow them, give you something you really can depend on. The Buddha is responsible all the way. You can trust him all the way. But to do that, you have to learn how to trust yourself. In other words, be trustworthy in the practice. The precepts, for instance, are not just nice ideas or rules that you hold to when it's convenient and rules that you put aside when it's not. The discernment in the precepts isn't the discernment of when, knowing when to observe them and when not to. It's knowing how to observe them in a skillful way. And these will present challenges. Household pests. How do you deal with them so you don't kill them? People ask prime information that you know if you give them the information, they're going to abuse it. How do you not give the information but at the same time not lie? Or when your friends insist that you have some intoxicants with them. How do you do it? How do you avoid taking the intoxicant in a way that doesn't offend them? These are things you've got to figure out. So taking the precepts does involve discernment. In fact, it, following the precepts develops all the qualities you need for meditation. You need to be mindful so that when the time comes when you might be tempted to break one of the precepts, you can remember, oh no, I can't do this. You want to get so that you even remember these things in your dreams. You need alertness to be careful about what you're doing, to make sure that it does follow the precepts. And you need the quality of ardency to remind yourself even when it's very, very, very tempting to break the precepts, you're not going to do it. And you can motivate yourself. So the next time you feel tempted, you can think back on how happy you were the last time you didn't give in to breaking the precept. That gives you strength. 
gives you an extra argument to use against the more unskillful voices in the mind. That, of course, includes discernment. So in sticking with the precepts, you are getting the mind ready to, to get into concentration. Those are the kind of precepts that they call pleasing to the noble ones, that incline the mind to want to, to settle down. As the Buddha said, the two things that are important for mindfulness and concentration are views made straight, i.e. seeing that, yes, your actions do really make a difference. They do have consequences. And then well-purified virtue. Because with mindfulness, remember, mindfulness is about keeping something in mind. It's about remembering. And if you do things that you're later going to regret, the mind starts putting up walls. First there's remorse, then there's denial. And you put up a wall to prevent yourself from remembering it. That's wounding your mindfulness right there. It's limiting it its range. And this is why so many people go through life with the attitude of live and don't learn. If you do something harmful, then you try to cover it up. How are you going to gain any insight? How are you going to have any mindfulness if you're covering things up in the mind? So remember, the precepts are not just there as rules to follow for the sake of following the rules. They're there to train the mind in the qualities you need that you can depend on. So you hold on to them. Same with concentration. You hold on to it. As John Fuhn used to say, you have to be crazy about the concentration in order to do it well. As you're on the path, this is your refuge, this is your nourishment. So even though there's some clinging, it's part of the path. The Johns all have images to illustrate this point. And John Fung's image was of a, a rocket going to the moon. When I was there in Thailand, it was not all that long after the American moonshot. And so day he talked about the image of meditating and then letting go. He says, you need the big booster to begin with, and then once it's done its job, then you let that go. And then there's a second stage, and then you let that go. You don't let it go until it's done its job. And Jamahabu's images of climbing a ladder up to the roof of a house. You hold on to one rung, and then you hold on to the higher one. And only when you've grasped the higher one do you let go of the lower rung so you can grasp one that's the next higher one up. You keep up this process. It's only when you actually get on the roof that you let go of the ladder. And John Cha's images of the person coming back from the market with a banana. Someone asks you, why are you carrying the banana? And you say, because I'm going to eat it. How about the peeler? You're going to eat that too? No. Then why are you carrying that? And John Chess says, how are you going to answer him? And the way he explains that actually has two levels. First he says, you answer with desire. In other words, you have to want to come back with a good answer in order to have a good answer. It's the same with the path. You have to want to do this. There is an element of craving in doing the path, an element of clinging. And then the next stage of his answer is you say, well, the time hasn't come yet to let it go. Once the time comes to let it go, then I'll let go of the peel. If I let go of it now, the banana becomes mush in my hand. It's the same with, re with your mind. You let go of the precepts, you let go of your concentration, your mind becomes mush. If you let go of discernment, your mind becomes mush. So you hold on to these things as you need them, because they're your true fortune, they're your true wealth. So 
So even though the people around you may be abandoning their wealth, they're even telling you it's a good thing not to have wealth. Don't believe them. Remember the old fable of the fox? The whole group of foxes one time, and there was a trap. And one by one by one, each of the foxes got its tail caught in the trap. In order to get out, all the hair on its tail had to be stripped off. So all these foxes were going around with naked tails. There was just one fox left that still had a nice bushy tail. So they tried to convince him that actually this is the latest style. Fortunately, the one remaining fox was smart enough to realize that they were just covering up for their own mistakes. So hold on to your wealth, because it's the only real wealth you've got that you can depend on. If you hold on to it, it will look after you. <laughs>